previous speakers, um, namely the liberalization of the Bulgarian gas market. Um, go on. Well, frankly speaking, I don't need that, so if you don't mind, <laughs> or just shout behind it. Um, hello, everyone. I hope I'm not going to bore you too much. It's not the most interesting topic, but it's quite relevant to what's happening at the minute. So, let me check whether I got the arrows right. Yes. <laughs> so, basically, I'm going to explain a bit more about why liberalization is important in the Bulgarian gas market, what is liberalization in general, and my idea of uh, why things are happening the way they are happening at the moment. This minute, the gas market is a result of this in Bulgaria. And what I found about it and how it feeds back into the big topic of the European Union single gas market. Right. Well, Bulgar the Bulgarian gas market is quite complex, frankly speaking, although pretty small. What's happened? Sorry, forgot about that. <laughs> Apologies about that. So the interesting thing is. In terms of the European Union, we have the lowest electricity and the second lowest gas prices in the European Union, which sounds great. However, when we compare that to the purchasing power of the population, what we get in return is highest utility, oof, okay. Okay, highest utility prices and the second highest gas price. Great, for <coughs> the country in the European Union. Why? What's happening is that in 2013, <coughs> most of the Bulgarians, probably everyone knows, is there were quite a lot of protests in the country in result of the high utility prices. The government resigned, and the current government is trying to struggle with the follow-up situation. What's happening in Ukraine is bringing some issues related to this subject <coughs> again. <coughs> Interestingly, the natural gas is only, accounts only for 12.6% of the domestic consumption, but its low price and carbon emissions, low carbon it's really important for our future development for what's happening in the energy mix of the country, but that's going to be explained a bit later on. So why the single European gas market saying whatever uh, is important for us? What it promises, according to the European Commission, is that it gives us an interrupted gas supply, affordable prices, and sustainable development through <coughs> market mechanisms, rather than oil index markets. That's a bit, I should have got rid of that. Unfortunately, there is a very slow progress of this framework. And that's going to be explained up to a point through my uh, dissertation work. So the objective of my work was to analyze the character of the Bulgarian gas liberalization through actors' preferences. What I'm using is the and Willems framework. And what they, they use as important uh, factors for preference formation is transaction costs, external threat, and the domestic variety of capitalism, which determines how companies and the state interact. How exactly companies interact among themselves and with state or at the state or basically institutions. So let's go through what gas liberalization actually means in terms of the European Union. How they describe it is the following breaking down the national monopolies of national utility companies. Stepping a bit out of that, it, what it means is that back in the days we had one national company that controlled everything, production, um, transportation, giving supplying gas to the final consumers, and that the whole thing was owned by the country, by the state. However, that at the minute, it's, that means, I mean, as we've already discussed earlier on, uh, this, the contemporary economics field claims that the state does not really know how to run markets. The state does not really know how to run companies, which makes co state-owned uh, companies inefficient. So what, what, is, uh, what the gas liberalization claims is that decreasing state intervention and increasing competition is going to bring uh, a lot of um, innovation, efficiency, and lower prices, and sustainability in the long term. So the effective allocation of resources, in our case gas, comes when you completely open the different segments of the market, the production, the transportation, reaching the final consumers. So it should not be the state company, it should not be the government doing this for us. And very important part of this is that there should be another third party access to pipelines, means the pipelines that you have in your country should be accessible to private companies, not just to the, to the government owned company. Great success story. However, what, what we have in Bulgaria is the following, really high, uh, 
really high external threat. We have just one supplier, 87% gas from Russia. Have amazingly high prices in comparison to Germany, for example. Let's not compare the industries. I am, I am aware that they have a bit more political power than us. However, a little, uh, so a one supplier, so in case something goes wrong with that supplier, what happens to us? I'm not gonna use the, the S word, but basically means we don't have gas supply. And this is exactly what happened in 2009 in the previous Ukraine-Russian um, conflict. What happened, I've just described in two sentences, 16 days of no gas supply in Bulgaria costed the industry in Bulgaria 250 million euros, a quarter of a billion, 16 days. And what a really nice guy from Harvard decided to do, he's, he's not even Bulgarian, just clarifying, he used government data and he proved that just a couple of months without gas supply to Bulgaria would have meant a total collapse of the Bulgarian economy. Just a couple of months, we're not talking about more. So 60 days, quarter of a minute. That means external threat, really high external threat. On the other hand, the high prices mean, and the single supply mean, that we have a lot of really high transaction costs because that means that companies are not very, it's not easy for companies to transfer their assets, to make maneuvers, to, to run their business. So what's happening is that we have a lack of consumer freedom as well. So if, if your family uses gas, like in the UK, as we know that's one of the most uh, common way to heat your home, if you want to switch from one company to another, you're not gonna be able to do that, even though it, in terms of legislation, you're allowed to do that in Bulgaria. But we're gonna go a bit further on that later on. Then there's no diversification of gas supply. So we have only the pipes. We don't have liquefied gas, for example, which is, wow, getting like a common thing in the rest of Europe. So 80% of the infrastructure, the pipelines that we have, are reserved for gas from supplies. So no access for another company. And then we have a, an independent regulator, but it seems like it's not really independent. The, there is a price regulation which distorts investment and development of the sector. Politicization, a lot of politicization, and then we have several, several uh, warnings from the European Commission for non-compliance with the rules. We signed even before we got into the EU in 2007. So, is it is it us reading the rules backwards, or it's how we would like to read them? Do we prefer to read them in that way? Is the question I asked last September, not September. So what I'm using here is that according to, according to this framework, it says that if you have really, really high external threat, that means that you have a lot of uncertainty. That means that you would support the, the, the single European gas market because it brings a lot of certainty. It gives you this really nice framework. It gives you rules about competition. It gives you a lot of clarified ideas how to run your business with certain freedom, of course. And then, of course, that curtails your freedom, but it gives you a lot of certainty. Transaction costs. Again, we are energy dependent. What is happening again is you have high transaction costs, you should support specialized arrangement because that minimizes your costs, literally, and connects you to other providers. But my third and most important factor in this framework is the domestic variety of capitalism. So what's the strategic interaction between the state or institutions and the firms? And I'm using a really nice and recent, unfortunately, framework calling our way, our domestic private capitalism, state-influenced market economy. So it's not just Bulgaria, it's uh, pretty much the whole ex-communist region in Eastern Europe. The most important thing we need to know about this is that there are impactful state actions coupled with a new liberal uh, interaction between companies and way of running business, which is a very interesting combination, don't you think? It's a bit contradictory. And because it's very complex, and in order to make sure that it does make sense, I will go through my notes so I don't miss some of the, the, the points. So the idea is that the Bulgarian, the Bulgarian form of capitalism is very peculiar with, because we have a very rapid liberalization process. This is not the UK or Germany taking decades of thinking how to make these things work. We have to follow the rules of international institutions. They told us in the 90s, do this, you're gonna get into the NATO. Do that, you're gonna get into the European Union and your problems will be solved. We did that. We didn't really have much of a choice, to be fair. But we did this, but while implementing market, market processes, we had to handle other issues as well. So what's happening is that it's the state implementing this thing. It's not the company supporting market mechanisms. It's the state saying, 
I'm not going to step in anymore. And while doing this, it fuses political and economic elites. And these are the ones running, running the new market in the country, the way the economic transactions are happening, which unfortunately prolongs the persistent socialist legacies that we're going to deal with a bit later on. So what's happening is that it's not surprising if the national government is running the liberalization process in whatever, whatever industry, in our case, gas, it's not surprising that you have external market liberalization process that is imposed on you, telling you this is what you should do. And then you have a very important transition from socialist to uh, basically, you know, from, a cap from socialist to a capitalist mode of not just, not just economic but even political governance. So what that means is that we, we get to this institutional particularism, as uh, these academics call it, or something that we all know as job assignments and benefits allocation according to political loyalty. Unfortunately, the transition, as we all know, in the 90s created another problem in this country, which is basically produces subnational inequalities that was not the case during communism, at least not obvious uh, inequalities. So what's happening is that the importance of welfare provision becomes extremely important for, for the variety of capitalism that we have in Bulgaria and the region. Welfare becomes very, very important. It's not just a socialist legacy, it's actually how uh, it means the, that's the only way for protection and economic growth for quite a big proportion of our society, unfortunately. So what happens at the political agency, the elite capture of the welfare system, brings so they invest interest in the way they created the institutions. And our gas liberalization is one of the products. So the way it's done, it's according to very particular ideas. And I'm not talking about ideologies, whether it's capitalist or whatever. It links back to the way the state, the institutions interact with firms and companies in our country. And this is why the liberalization process should be think through in terms of this. How exactly do the institutions interact with companies and the companies among themselves? So, this is why I claim, I claim in uh, chapter two, I think, that the strongest actor in the gas market remains the state-owned company, or basically the state. And this is why, although it, it faces really high external threat and uh, transaction costs, because of the, the way our capitalism works, the gas market is going to be restrained according to the preference for control over energy resources and welfare provision of the state. And then the setup, the way it's done and regulated will echo this as well, not just how it's described, but how it's done. And then the state control would, would be linked to welfare provision. So then we go to the success story. Yes, we do have a, you know, in terms of legislation, we do have a liberalized gas market. We have a very, very fantastic, uh, State Energy Water Regulatory Commission that we can just call the regulator. And uh, our National Energy Act was, uh, was adapted to the directive, the European directive. So that means we have the equality of companies, so our state national companies should not be prioritized. We have uh, access of third com the companies to the pipelines. We have limit, limited highlight, limited state intervention, no subsidies, uh, but the consumers are allowed to use select their supplier, and the commission, the regulatory body, has the independence to regulate gas prices, gas rate, everything. The only actor to issue the role licenses. That's supposed to be one of the biggest corrector of market failures and make sure that this, this actor, the regulatory commission, was supposed to ensure that the government does not make any interference in the way this is done and, it's, and the gas market is not fun functioning. But the most important <coughs> is the embundling of Bulgargas, which is the state-owned company that used to have the whole market production, transport, and ending up with the consumers. So this is the biggest success with the regulatory commission. Great. So what's happening, however, is that what we have at the minute. So the biggest decision makers in the, in the sector is the Ministry of Economy, Energy, and Tourism, which owns the Bulgarian energy holding and the commission that uh, commission is the other uh, decision maker. But if we focus on, on on this holding here, we see that this is it basically owns every energy company that we have in every major energy field in Bulgaria. What we, we should focus on is here, Bulgar gas and Bulgar gas. 
So why this is not considered uh, a breach of liberalization is because what we claim, and it's legally written out as well, is that BEG does not have any operational functionality uh, in terms of these, these uh, subsidiarity, uh, subsidiarity of, the, of the big one. So basically, it, BEG does not involve with the market uh, behavior of these companies. So it's just, we're just a cap, we just uh, supposed the stakeholder and the, share, and the share owner, but we don't tell them how to run their business. This is how what we claim, and this is why the Bulgarian Competition um, Commission says that it's finding some breach of competition. Let's go to the market segment. So in the upstream market, we're, where we talk about exploration and production of gas, we have only two exploration companies. One of them is British, Melrose, and another one is Bulgarian. But they can, and they claim that we're going to have a five-fold increase in the, in the uh, gas production in Bulgaria. But again, how, how much more could it get from 12%? Really, Re realistically speaking. We are not introducing uh, shale gas, so again, we're using just the normal conventional gas production. And we have one wholesale trader, the, Bul the Bulgar Gas, which is the Bulgarian state-owned company. If we go, and the very important thing about Bulgargas is that it owns 97.3% of the Bulgarian gas supply and transport to the end consumer. So we're talking about pretty much a monopoly here, 97.3% of the market. And what else happens is that Bulgargas has the, uses strategic interaction with its supplier, Gazprom, which is politically backed. So for, uh, right after the, uh, no, a bit before the resignation of the previous government, our ex-prime minister uh, negotiated a 20% decrease in the gas price from Gazprom, which again, it, it wasn't the Bulgarga CEO who did it, it was the prime minister who did it. And it was absolutely <coughs> openly set. And then what happened was that we are using really old fashioned long contracts, which take like 35 years, so it's very difficult to get out of this contract, which obviously limits your maneuvers and limits your activity. The other thing that, that happens is that um, Bugatas is the one who has access to the pipelines. So 80% of the pipelines are accessed just thanks to only by Bugatas, no one else. And it, it runs most of the licenses for a lot of activities in the market, so basically monopoly. Then if we go through the midstream market, we have one transmission opera uh, system operator, that's basically the guys running the pipelines. And this is Bulgar Trans, another familiar face from the previous slide. And that's the only underground gas storage owner as well. We unfortunately don't have too many, too many st storages, so the fact is, in, in case there is a problem, it will be the Bulgar Trans owning the storage. Yeah, I was going to go back. So basically we have only, we have very highly concentrated the downstream market, with just two companies basically running it. So, uh, the private companies in Bulgaria have explained quite a lot of times through official, official means that they would like gas liberalization, but it's not done because Bulgar gas remains the, the, the monopolist. Why? Well, the deregulation type of Bulgaria is such that Bulgar gas controls the pipelines, and it says it shows preference for, for Bulgar gas, and it allows only Bulgar gas to win access. Why? You would think that they're completely unbundled, just five to five differences. Of they have the same uh, physical premises, they have the same owner, they have the same software, including software, the way they run their company. Even the government, the, the different departments in this country use different software. Uh, so what happens is the following. This is the, the interesting bit. The way we liberalized our market is such that these companies could could regularly, basically not just re remain, con they just not have the control over the, the market. What's happening is that the commission, the regulatory body, helps them as well in terms of <coughs> price regulation. We are very heavily price regulated, which means that you have uh, you have a particular price that it has, has to be used when you're dealing with end consumers. And gas, Bulgar gas usually does it even at its own loss. In 2009, it lost billions of lives just because it has to use the price by the regulator, which is assigned by the prime minister. And it's not just assigned, but there's no, that's the biggest gap in our legislation. There's no legislation describing what are the limitations of this commission and who it accounts to. So if the government elects the, the board, who decides and who, who are you accountable to? So what happens is the following. 
you think, well, what's the connection with the, between the utility prices and the gas prices? The, fo the thing is the following. How, going back to, uh, eh, of course, I, I pressed the wrong button. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, it's fine. I'll just, I'll just, uh, describe, yeah, I know. So what basically what's happening is the following. We have this price that it's imposed on you, and then when, you, when, when the, the, there are protests, and when um, you need to de decrease the price, what you do is that you decrease the price of the gas because the subsidiaries are go back to BEC. So the way BEC decreases its prices, utility prices, is that it makes a loss in one of the one of the smaller firms. For example, Bulgar, Bulgar gas is gonna have a massive, huge loss, but then the electricity is gonna be cheaper. And who gives you that freedom in, in a completely liberalized market? Only if your market is structured in that way. So what happens is that you provide something very important to the Bulgarian uh, society. According to the World Bank, 61% of our population is energy poor. So if we actually pay the actual price of the utility bills, we go energy poor. We're talking about everyone, not just uh, you know, the whole segment of the society. So this is why what our, our um, variety of capitalism offers us is that we, we become liberalized, we could Pretend that we're like uh, the, the rest of the European countries, or at least what they think, want us to do, although they don't do it as well, but that's a question. We managed to have a more efficient, a supposedly more efficient um, market, which follows market, uh, market uh, regulations. And third, you have the welfare provision, which is not offered because the country, once again, I highlight, it's not supposed to pay subsidies because of the, because of the European Union. You're not supposed to pay subsidies, and we, don't, we can't afford to pay direct subsidies to the people who, who are energy poor. So this is how we do it. So my question is, why this is a problem for the European framework is that it shows one of the biggest vulnerabilities of the single European gas market. They forget that our capitalism works differently. They forget that this is not tabula rasa. You don't just impose rules without forgetting what were the interactions between companies and institutions beforehand. So it's not just about whether we want, to, uh, whether we can be physically linked to each other, it's whether we want to be linked with the other countries. Thank you.